Hi, this is Bill Mara, speaking to you from Rome, Italy. I'd like to tell you today about a new book that I've written called Solder Smoke, A Global Adventure in Radio Electronics. A while back I wrote another book called Contra Cross, published by Naval Institute Press in 2006. This book has nothing to do with radio electronics. I enjoyed writing it, I was pleased to get it published, but I said to my wife, the next time I do a book I want to do something that's a little bit more fun, a little bit more inspirational. I, uh, that's what led me to this book, Solder Smoke, A Global Adventure in Radio Electronics. Um, I say this is a, a book about my secret after-hours life in radio electronics, a secret round the world after-hours -hour life, after life in radio electronics. It's secret because most people just don't understand this kind of thing. And I've found that mentioning my interest in radio and electronics to coworkers often results in kind of <laughs> concerned looks on their face. So it's best to keep these things private just between us radio, uh, radio amateurs. It's around the world uh, life in my case because my job as a diplomat sends me to many different foreign countries and I've had the opportunity to pursue this hobby in many different places. And um, I'd like to just share with you um, some experiences. The book, a part of the book is a nostalgic look at my, uh, my time as a radio amateur and some of the things that I went through, especially as a, as a kid, how I got started in this thing. Let me read you one excerpt, and this is about antennas. Um, put the book up here. Let's see if I get myself in position, of course. The radio, the radio books depict dipoles of simple, happy antennas. Just two lengths of wire, one quarter wavelength long, suspended at each end by a friendly, convenient tree. The reality, of course, is very different. You need a good te technique for attaching the coaxial cable securely to the antenna, and you need a method of getting the two ends attached securely to the trees that would be its support. There's a vast amount of radio literature devoted to getting dipoles into trees. You can find articles with detailed descriptions of how to make durable connections between coaxial cable and, and the antenna wire. There are thoughtful articles about how to use slingshots, kites, and even small potato launching cannons known as spud guns to get the wires over recalcitrant trees. Clearly, a little research and forethought make the task a lot easier. But enthusiastic 13-year-olds are not big on research and forethought. They are men of action. They are impatient. They want to get things done. Even if the lack of planning and preparation means that the task at hand will take them ten times as long and produce inferior short-lived results. My technique was as follows. Gather bits of wire. Possible sources including elect include electrical extension cords, not currently in use, or the wires for table lamps that were not, at the moment of inspection, actually turned on. Step two, strip insulation off the ends of the wire using the standard insulation stripping tool, aka your teeth. Try to avoid the involvement of your expensive orthodonture apparatus unless, of course, the sharp edges of this apparatus are found to aid in the insulation stripping. Step three, hastily twist the bits of wire together. Don't solder them together. This would waste time, and besides, you'd need an extension cord. Step four, quickly measure out quarter wavelengths using the formula from the radio handbook. A measuring device would be helpful at this point, but being 13 years old, you won't be able to find one. So try to find something that is roughly one foot long. Your father's size 12 dress shoe is an obvious choice. Be sure to leave the shoe outside when that summer thunderstorm suddenly requires you to go indoors. Step 5. Attach the antenna wire to the coaxial cable by the same solder-free twist-together technique described in Step 3. And finally, Step 6. Find some rocks that can be tied to string and thrown over suitable branches. Spend hours trying to pitch the rock string apparatus over the selected branches. At this point, being 13 years old has some distinct advantages. Just think how silly you will look when you try to do essentially the same thing at age 43. Of course, many of the strings got tangled and broke, leaving a number of rocks hanging precariously from branches in our backyard, like some sort of weird work of modern art. I think some of them stayed up there for years. Sometimes I'd worry that my dad would get conked in the head by the result of my slapdash dipole construction. Okay, gives you a little bit of the, the flavor of the book. But I'd like to point out that it's not all nostalgia and memoirs. It's, um, it's not all a nostalgia and memoir. 
there's a, a technical element of it too. And what I've done is, in addition to telling stories about my adventures uh, as a radio amateur, I've also described um, my struggles to understand radio theory. You see, early in my elect electromagnetic youth, I was influenced by Gene Shepard and by a number of other people who believed that to be a true radio amateur, you not only had to build your own gear, but you really had to know how it works. You had to understand the circuitry. You had to be able to discuss it. You really had to know what was going on behind the panel. And so for that reason, as a radio amateur, I've always struggled to kind of understand this stuff. It hasn't been easy. I'm not a professional electronics engineer. And so this has been a, the work. I've been a complete amateur at this. Maybe being an amateur at it puts me in a better position to describe some of these situations to my fellow amateurs. Let me give you an example here, if I can find it real quick. About, let me see, where is it? Um, I had this mark, but then I lost my, my marker. Ah, this has to do with mixers. It says here, over the years I frequently became aware of the fact that I didn't really understand what was happening in the mixer circuit. At times, I thought that I understood it, but then I'd, be, then I'd dig deeper and find that my understanding was incorrect or incomplete. Mixers are absolutely key stages in almost, every, in almost all amateur transmitters and receivers, and I knew that as a radical fundamentalist home brewer, I'd eventually have to really understand how these circuits work. There are many paths to confusion in this area. You can be misled by graphical explanations and by hand-waving verbal descriptions. And I think that purely mathematical explanations fail to provide the kind of intuitive understanding that we are looking for. Let me describe some of the pitfalls. Anyway, I describe some of the pitfalls and then I describe how I've come to a certain level of understanding about how these circuits work. And I hope that, that readers of the book will find these descriptions uh, useful and illuminating. So it's, I, for that reason, I think it's a, it's a worthwhile book to take to the beach or to take on vacation. It's, um, it's, it's fun, but hopefully in the process of reading it, you'll, you'll also learn something and improve your understanding of radio electronic theory. There's a third element I think is important in the book, and I like to mention it here, and that is the element of international fraternity, the brotherhood of radio electronics. You know, I've been struck in my travels around the world, and all the radio clubs I've been to, I've been struck by the fact that there's a great similarity. All of us have essentially the same story. For some reason, many of us got interested in this stuff when we were teenagers or preteens, and we've stuck with it on and off pretty much ever since. Um, it's really striking how similar our stories are and how they're the same from country to country. This is great because it gives us something in common, something that transcends national differences, something that transcends the kind of problems that caused me to write the first book. Um, we call this the International Brotherhood of Electronic Wizards. And I hope that the book Solder Smoke describes that brotherhood and, and, and explains why it's so important and so useful and, and so why it's so important for us to, to, to foster it, to encourage its, its continuation, and to keep it going. Anyway, that's a little description of the book. The name of the book is, I'll hold it up here for you, this is what they always do at this point, Solder Smoke, A Global Adventure in Radio Electronics. It's published by HBR Press, that's me, uh, through the print-on-demand services of lulu.com. It ships worldwide. I'm told that it ships quite, quite quickly. There are printing plants in the United States and in Europe. If you want more information on it, go to soldersmoke.blogspot.com or soldersmoke or www.soldersmoke.com and you'll find the links to the Lulu page where you can buy the book. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks very much for listening.